And within months, there was a prosecution underway of a man in Texas who had been holding an African-American worker as a slave for almost 15 years. He was convicted by a federal jury in 1942 and went to federal prison. I mark that as the technical end of slavery in America. I didn't know that people could be just picked up and put in jail. They could be lost in the system and nobody knew where to find them. They could be buried in some grave somewhere and family's still looking for them. Don't know where they are. I didn't know that the sheriff department could sell free black people to corporations, steel plants and coal mines. It wasn't in the history books. We didn't know. 30 years had passed. But except for the electric lights, Ezekiel Archie would have easily recognized the conditions Green Cottenham now faced. Above ground, though, Birmingham was becoming the region's largest industrial center. The mine that leased Green's labor was now owned by the northern-based U.S. Steel, the largest corporation in the world. Fifty, seventy, ninety percent interest rates were not uncommon all throughout the South in relation to sharecropping finance of the, the basic necessities that they needed to get through a year. So that system is going to put African Americans in a position where upward mobility is essentially impossible for most of them. But without legal or political rights, black sharecroppers were especially vulnerable. Millions of black people in remote parts of the South could not leave the farms they were being held on. If they did, they were subject to arrest by the sheriff. And if they were arrested, they would then be returned to the very same farms, oftentimes in chains, receiving nothing. Sharecropping is not slavery, but it did become, for an enormous population of people, forced labor. Families stayed intact probably within a two-mile radius of where they were born. Mothers, fathers, cousins, grandparents, everybody stayed. If you knew by the mere fact of leaving exposed you to the danger of being caught up in this system, it made you stay. You knew what would happen if you stepped off. December 1941, the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor brought the United States into the Second World War. 
President Roosevelt convened a meeting of the cabinet at the White House to discuss preparations to fight this war against Japan and Germany. The president asked, what are the things that the Japanese are going to attack us for in the course of the war that are problematic? Someone said, the treatment of the Negro. Nearly 80 years had passed since the United States ratified the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Now, in December 1941, President Roosevelt took steps to finally enforce it. Just five days after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt's Attorney General issued Circular 3591. It said that federal attorneys were to aggressively prosecute any case of involuntary servitude or slavery, not only those defined as peonage. He says whether they're being held there because of a threat of imprisonment or out of violence, whatever the mechanism is that is holding people in slavery, you should go after it. And he says this is part of the war effort. These cases are important because we need to make sure that African Americans feel like their rights are being taken care of. And within months, there was a prosecution underway of a man in Texas who had been holding an African-American worker as a slave for almost 15 years. He was convicted by a federal jury in 1942 and went to federal prison. I mark that as the technical end of slavery in America. The records are incomplete, but it's estimated that in the 80 years following the Civil War, as many as 800,000 people had faced the South's corrupt system of justice. Huge numbers of those arrested were forced into involuntary servitude. Some, including Viola Cosley's son, Marion, found freedom. On January 7, 1943, he enlisted as a private in the U.S. Army, one of more than 2.5 million African Americans who registered for service during the Second World War. Green Cottenham, arrested in 1908, might have served in the First World War, but by the Second World War, he would have been in his 50s. But Green never made it out of the Birmingham prison mines. We don't know the exact details of the life that he led in the stockade or underground, but he survived five months before becoming ill he went to see the doctor on August the 2nd, 1908. He never went back to the mine. Thirteen days later, Green Cottenham died. He is among more than 9,000 prisoners, known to have died while leased to industry by southern states and counties. We want to think of some of these atrocities as things that happened occasionally, but you can imagine the turmoil if at any time your child could be picked up, never to be seen again, how that would impact a whole segment of people, how they view their opportunities um, and, and their future. In all likelihood, his body was dumped somewhere in these fields outside the mine where hundreds of other prisoners also lie buried. This was real, these were real people these were real lives and they make us who we are what's fascinating about green cottingham is the fact that he isn't special he's not well known he's not a historical figure of you know importance but that's part of the beauty he is representative of all of these nameless faceless people who disappeared during this time frame who were deemed to be of no value and then you realize the value isn't in being necessarily important. We all have interesting stories. We all have a life story worth telling. Kids want to know whether their loved ones are alive in custody or dead in the wake of a dramatic confrontation between police and striking miners in South Africa. Nobantu Mkuzi says her husband left home to go to the protest Thursday morning and never came back. And now she says the police aren't telling her where he is. The 
deadly hail of police bullets shocked the country. People were watching replay after replay of the video. A day later, the police chief put the casualty toll at 34 dead and 78 wounded. She said officers acted to protect their own lives when confronted by strikers who had dangerous weapons. But others had another take on South Africa's worst shooting since the end of the apartheid era. A national newspaper warned a ticking time bomb had exploded over the widening rift between rich and poor who want a share of the mineral wealth. They can beat us, kill us, and kick and trample on us. We aren't going back to work, and they won't be able to employ anyone. If they employ other people, they won't be able to work either. We'll stay and kill them. We are justified to ask for a higher salary. Right here. 